experience with masculinity was uh, when I was 19 and I joined the military. That was like my first real experience with toxic masculinity. So in, the, in wartime, in the military that I was a part of, that is very much a, a machoism kind of thing, is your control. You start to learn, okay, I need to sound more tough, I need my voice deeper. I need to sound more in control of the situation. I carry myself more in a masculine manner. It's a dangerous thing, and it was dangerous. I mean, there is like a certain machoism of being like, yes, I am the one who was in charge of this mission. I'm the one who uh, called this bomb to be dropped. Like, I am the one who uh, has so many KIAs that means killed in action. Well, I mean, I worked on a technology that created a drone program, and it's the same type of technology that has been talked about with all of these little social media programs that suck up all your data, and then decide that there are these patterns that happen in the world, and these patterns and these people's lives they need to be blown up. It's flying over their head day and night. They don't know if they look to their left or their right or if they're going to see their mother in pieces. I mean, if there was a drone flying above this table right now, I could look at any one of you and not know if I see your arm laying over there. And nobody even thinks about that, and that's the same kind of care that thinking about a nuclear explosion causes. He's really great us, right? In a very aggressive way, okay, very personal way. How about I'm um, really saying something very, very uh, radical? Let's assassinate him. And whoa, I feel that I'm a little problem. But isn't, sorry, but, but yeah. isn't he just a, a symptom? He's a mushroom, so we see only the head, but aren't they anywhere? Because sometimes the neck like that change the course of history. You have to keep the target, you have to keep what you have to do right now, but you also have to decide for yourself on which side of history you want to be. Because if you cannot acknowledge complexities, then you are on the wrong side of history. It doesn't matter what you do in one certain moment. We have to acknowledge political complexities. We are not black and white. We are not good and bad. We are not man and woman. We are much, much more than that, between that and beyond. There's rights that we all agreed and signed up to, and they can't just be ignored when it's convenient for us. If there's a dictator we don't like, let's just eliminate him without, you know, without any kind of due process, without a trial, let's kill him. Do we believe in capital punishment? I mean, it's madness. It's, it's a bit like Guantanamo, and where that got us into, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a totally disastrous way of... Well, let's discuss it for a problem. Let's discuss it. Let's go to the table. Could you give us one single example of an assassination that really changed history to a positive way? I think we have an issue with the fact that we we, we think the armament issue of nuclear weaponry is linked to one map, and I think that's a mistake. And we have to use the fact that we have an opponent in a superpower that is so ridiculed to make aware globally that we are a superpower that is trying to lead by example. And it's a stark example to someone who's so base. And we should not be thinking about assassinations because we are not for violence. We did not come here to proliferate violence. And if we were, then I don't know why we are here.
agendas. But rather on what kind of culture we really want to live in and reconstruct all the things that we have been born into, that have been normalized. Let's um, actually blow up those norms that we speak of destruction and uh, create new norms. What kind of society do we want to live in and then experience that? We will do mistakes, we will do things where we will hurt people, it will be warm at times, but these will be experiences if we keep on learning, if we keep on redeveloping uh, those norms. And I think this is the way to go, rather than idealizing women or our gender and then trying to construct a new society based on this. I think it's really important that if we want to change anything with the all female uh, government, then we have to also change the way we do things. Because if we just wear our vaginas and then when the men in their own name, then what did we do? We didn't do anything. I'm also skeptical of the biological determinism um, that says that if women rule the world, then we want peace forever. I don't think we should romanticize female leadership. The female founder of the US president was a woman who was brought up and who came up in a system of white, middle class, cis, able-bodied, heterosexual men. And this is the kind of woman that that system produced. So maybe if we change the system, it will produce different leaders. I come from matriarchal society, in fact. And uh, women are very strong in this matriarchal. The women can marry, in fact, other women. In case you don't have a child, you are allowed to marry another woman and have the children together and live together peacefully. And it's accepted in the society. I think that men have fooled quite for a long time. It would be time to also to look at different concepts. Give women also a chance to move and see how it looks like. Being a feminist doesn't mean you have to be peaceful and every conflict has to be solved by sitting around the bonfire. We are very much capable of taking a collection pump and leading the way in front of the men and taking care of enemies. The Kurdish revolution in, in Syria, um, the armed forces, mostly made up of the Kurdish people, 40% of them are women. This war gave them an opportunity to claim their identity, to say, we have the same rights as men. We don't have to wait decades. We're just going to go and claim our rights. This is not just to win a war against the Islamic State and the Syrian regime. This is also to win the war against men. My question is, why do we need to be in the army? Why do we need to play uh, with guns? Why? Fight to be part of this patriarchal violent structure. I think one of the most characteristic facts of war is that it touches everybody in the society. War is not a man's game. War involves entire societies. And how we think about war and how we speak about war should reflect that. If we're talking about change that has to last and that has to be sustainable, I think we need to um, think in terms of whole populations and um, a shift in political consciousness. I think there is a, there is a huge misunderstanding uh, about who the people are that you're going to war against or who the people are whose country you are occupying. And so when the military goes to a country, uh, they have a certain definition that they use for, for people who are the other. I can say the other meaning the people who are not themselves. Uh, so when they consider this other, they use words to dehumanize them. And in order to change this, this idea in the military and in uh, the first world right now, is to re-educate people that the other is not other. The other is a full human being with all of the same human rights and, and all of the same qualities as oneself. But it's um, proving to be really more and more hard um, to portray this. People are celebrating, uh, watching people being killed in front of them, and there's blood coming out of them, and they're still not uh, convinced of their humanity. Hello. Uh, that was really quick time. Uh, I don't know. Later. Late. What can you do? No, don't do what? Hi, darling. Hi, uh, yeah, who's working really late tonight? Um, can Daddy see it? Please? Right, okay, quickly. <clears throat> who's my favorite boy in the whole wide world? It's you, it's you, it's you. Who can make the dark sky shine so blue? It's you, it's you, it's you. 
Don't no, apologize, it's fine. Thank you. Well, I have to say, I am very proud to be leading an all female government. I wish we weren't the only one. But if we may ask, I suppose, just bringing it slightly back, and this may sound like once more, but please tell me, can we adopt a slightly more feminist, defensive military strategy? Just hit me with it. <laughs> But coming back to what you said and the question you ask, I think that uh, where, where uh, women at the table in the negotiating processes, um, peace is more sustainable. I very much believe in women. Think of Northern Ireland where women uh, started the peace process really because they didn't want to have their fathers, sons and husbands sent into war and being killed and being killed themselves. And that's what we have to do. But how do we make sure that more women will be in the peace processes? I think this is important because it, it shows that often in peace processes, you talk about building roads or doing big things. It turns out that women are know the everyday life which is present in a war zone, and they can start different things, which means that children can go to school, they can get food. So I, I think this is the key to women participating in the peace processes and we have seen that when women are there, other questions are asked. The role models are also important. We have a female president in Finland and suddenly all Finnish girls wanted to become president. And it was very interesting because many men said they want to be married to the president. <laughs> we would all be very much wiser if we knew already how this would work differently. But to tell you the truth, myself being a cultural anthropologist, I don't think in these short term uh, periods, but I, I tend to think in long historical uh, periods. In fact, I think already for 100 or 200 years, we are already moving to quite a different society with another gender order. And that makes me quite optimistic. I would call it patriarchy. I think you must think of patriarchy as something that is gone or is going to be gone in a very short time. That changes your idea. General Lola, do you think your gender has influenced your decision making? No. Does it help the negotiations or does it hinder? How do we begin a feminist defense strategy? I am so sorry to interrupt you, uh, Madam President. Um, I'm receiving an urgent update. President Twitter is giving a press conference live as we speak. I have a live feed. Let me have to see. He's got it. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. Twitter has positioned some of his warheads against one of our key partners. I think the best thing we can do with our time now is to ask each one of you to state what you think we should do in light of this escalation. We have to engage all of our resources that we have available to us to uh, shelter our citizens and make sure that they have places to be safe if there is a nuclear attack. For me, that's the first priority. Aiming your missiles at uh, an enemy does not protect your people, it protects your interests. What I'm thinking is, um, is this meant for us to take as a real threat? Is this an exercise? Or is this President Twitter um, following the classical madman strategy uh, trying to make us very unsettled in order to gain something? I think we should stay calm for the time being and think about what might be motivating this. Why don't we make the call of getting assassinated now? That will also shock them, and that will allow us to buy some more time. The military has been trained to continue if the president is dead. The point here is, he is provoking you with this. Now you either respond to this provocation by doing the same thing, and then it escalates, and then you have your land nuclear war, or you don't. There is only one way to de-escalate, and that is not to escalate. 
what I can advise is to go directly to the diplomatic solution without even discuss, without even bringing nuclear weapons into the table. We don't need to talk about nuclear weapons, and we don't need to use them as a retaliatory object. Given the lunatic that he is, I would actually take his actions very seriously. I would advise to bring our nuclear warheads into position, activate them, so we level the playing field for maximum deterrence, and then we start the diplomatic conversation. I will not recommend to um, immediately now react by raising our uh, you know, uh, awareness um, or force readiness level. I think that that would be premature in the current situation. I, I think that, of course, we need to inform the relevant you know, um, institutions so that they are prepared in case there is a need to, to take the step. But you know, that will be a step of escalation from our side in a situation which is not yet completely clear. And I think that is much too risky. I think this guy respects strength. And I think you need to convince him that you have the same strong capabilities. And that if he obliterates his country, it will have grave consequences for his country. You want to hold this guy off. You want him to not attack your ally. You want to remind him we have the same strike capability. At the same time, mobilize internationally, mobilize the coalition. Everyone will be able to see that what he is doing is crazy. And then we might actually have the momentum to achieve lasting disarmament. Two nuclear attacks is not the, the, the solution for the threat of one nuclear attack because that means that twice as many people will, will die and be deformed. And if people survive, the generations following will be absolutely destroyed. And we personally, with everything that I've seen in the world and, every, and the horrible experiences that I've had, I would rather uh, die in, in an act of peace than to kill millions of people or potentially kill millions of people by reacting to a nuclear attack from a selfish government. Uh, that's my personal opinion. You need to actually speak about them in a very small manner so that you've not taken action, that you can't step back from it. When you give the order as a president, you can't call it back. General Norman, what do you think? I can more or less uh, say that I agree to what has been said. I believe the deep analysis of, of, of the nature of the problem, what lies behind it, is very important and reaching out for the diplomatic channels. But I will also say that the mediator could be you, Madam President. You have been a nation that goes for unilateral disarmament, non-proliferation, and has shown a peaceful way forward 